Hi everyone, thank you for joining the School-Based Health Alliance for today's webinar, Hearing Hoofbeats from a Distance, Primary Care and Telehealth. As school-based telehealth care becomes more critical to maintaining students' access to care, many clinicians are venturing into a virtual approach to primary care. This webinar offers an opportunity to learn from presenters who deliver primary care via school-based telehealth. Presenters will use a round-style collabor collaborative discussion of evaluating, diagnosing, and treating patients remotely based on clinical cases. The School-Based Health Alliance works to improve the health of children and youth by advancing and advocating for school-based health care. We believe that all children and adolescents deserve to thrive, but too many struggle because they lack access to health care services. School-based health care is the solution bringing healthcare to where students already spend the majority of their time in school. When health and education come together, great things happen. Attendance improves, conditions like asthma or diabetes are better managed, and behavioral health issues get quick expert attention. And we all know that healthy students make better learners. Now, we have a few housekeeping reminders. All attendees are in listen-only mode. However, we want to hear your questions. To ask a question at any point during the webinar, please use the Q&A tool located in your Zoom control bar. We will address questions following the presentation. At the end of this webinar, attendees will be asked to complete evaluation poll questions. Please let us know how we are doing. Your feedback is vital in helping us craft presentations that meet your needs. This webinar is being recorded and will be archived on our website in one to three business days. Please also visit the School-Based Health Alliance website for additional archived webinars for topics such as the ones that you are viewing on your screen. Now, I would like to introduce our presenters for today. Steve North is the Founder and Medical Director at the Center for Rural Health Innovation. Kelly Garber is the Lead Advanced Practice Provider and Clinical Integration Specialist at the Center for Telehealth at the Medical University of South Carolina and Stormy Williams is the Vice President and Medical Director for Network Development and Innovation at Children's Health. Now I will hand it over to Steve. Great, thank you very much. Let me go through the exciting world of sharing my screen. Hopefully I don't show my family pictures and emails and stuff. But hi, my name is Steve North and I'm a family doc and adolescent medicine specialist and help lead the Healthy Schools Network, where we serve uh, 105 schools in the mountains of Western North Carolina um, via telehealth. So this is a, an interesting case that I saw last year um, with the initial complaint being lumps on my legs. So the, uh, this is a 15 year old male who came to me and said that he developed lumps on his legs over the course of the past six months. The lump on the left was bigger and at, he's a competitive soccer player. And at the end of his practices, he was saying that it felt full at the end of practice and, and sometimes actually ached a little bit. He's been playing competitive soccer since he was seven, has been on a travel team and is currently in a development league where he is practicing two to four hours a day, six days a week. And he is really beginning to feel the impact of this on almost a daily basis. So when we took pictures of his legs, you can see on, um, that there are these uh, sort of shinier areas that are the raised bumps. Uh, his right leg is on your left, his left leg is on your right. I circled one of the areas. Um, it's not a great, image, but it was more easily seen um, on video because we actually could turn to the side somewhat. So, of course, I got additional history and the lumps are painless at rest and sometimes not even there. To date, they have not restricted his activity in any way. He has no family history of uh, similar masses developing. And I, I'll add that he, he said he didn't have any other masses on his body. Um, he is SMR stage four, BMI is 52nd percentile. Um, if you have other questions, um, please put them in the, the Q&A box. And let folks try to answer them as they come up. Pause here for a second to let people type them in.
No questions. Everybody has already figured out the answer and said, this is, ah, all right. Thank you, anonymous attendee. Does he have Osgood Slaughter? Uh, no, he does not have Osgood Slaughter. Great question. Um, injury history uh, from two folks. Um, no injuries, you know, precise injuries at the site. Six months ago, he did not have an event where he got hit with a sledgehammer or, or something like that, but a great question. Any other questions? Uh, lipoma or cholesterol deposits, both great things to be thinking about. We're gonna to step towards the differential in a couple of minutes. Yeah. Um, and does he have an allergy history? Another great question. He does not have a significant allergy history. Erythema nodosa, we should definitely add that to the, to the list in our differential. All right, does he have hyperflexible joints? Thank you, Melanie, um, or elastic skin. And he does not have any real sign of uh, one of the Ehlers-Danlos type syndrome. Pictures. All right, those are all good questions. Additionally, on review of systems, is there anything people would like to ask? So things that I thought about and did ask, didn't put in the slide, um, were any night sweats or um, fevers, and that was a negative. Also any unanticipated or unexpected weight loss, and, and that was also negative. Travel history. Um, he does not have any travel history outside of the US. He does compete around the Southeast on a, on a regular basis two weekends a month. And sexual history, oh wait, explain acronyms and is it psychosomatic? Um, all right, sorry, acronyms, um, the, let's see, Ehlers-Danlos I think is the, what I refer to and that's a, a family of conditions where people have hypermobility of joints and in some forms of Ehlers-Danlos you can have aortic dilatation it's uh, based on some genetic uh, cartilaginous gene variations. Um, does he have a sexual history? Thank you. He is not sexually active with penile vaginal or penile anal intercourse. And any history of ganglion cysts? No. Ah, thanks, Melanie. Yes, sexual maturity rating. Sexual maturity rating is the SMR. Thank you. So it is stage four, meaning that he has gone through most of puberty. He still may have a growth spurt coming. BMI is body mass index, um, no trauma history. He does not report any history of physical abuse and um, they may be fatty lipomas. Let's, uh, let's dig into this a little bit more. So I do a physical exam and because I'm virtual um, and seeing this just via video in one of our schools, I can listen to his heart and lungs, I can use an otoscope um, but I'm not able to actually palpate. It's one of the limitations. But he's a healthy 15-year-old kid, um, and so I'm able to sort of guide him through an exam. And so I can have the camera held close by, we use school nurses as our facilitators, and I had him palpate the mass, and he sort of described it to me. And so he has multiple subcutaneous masses on both legs. They're non-tender, they're not inflamed, they, they don't sort of, I described, do they feel like there's jelly or, or, or jello moving back and forth? And he said, no, um, they weren't warm to the touch. I did not see any erythema. They weren't rock hard in any way. And, and the most prominent was this mass <coughs> on, on his left calf. Um, and he said that that had actually been there the longest and when he pushes on it, that's the one that's always there after practice. The other ones sort of come and go. But when he pushed on it, there was no tenderness, but it fed, felt his words were sort of kind of full. All right. Ooh, and some other, um, other options for our differential diagnosis, uh, lymphatic system blockage. All right, wait, jumped ahead too far. Physical jam. 
I think I mislabeled my quest my uh, questions here. Sorry. So we're going to go to the poll. And which of the following causes right now, sort of thinking about our differential, there are a number of items in the chat to consider. Which do you think is most likely? Infectious, um, oncologic, metabolic, thinking about the um, cholesterol deposits there, um, a musculoskeletal issue, or something in the world of, of vascular? So if you can, can vote there, that'd be great. All right, lots of folks thinking sort of musculoskeletal or vascular are top, top leaning items. Yep, um, metabolic, carry some weight, and um, infectious and, and oncological less, less likely in everybody's mind. All right, next step. What additional studies would you order? And um, would you get labs? And if you want labs, can you put some ideas in the chart? An x-ray, an ultrasound, or I'm, I'm sorry, put lab ideas in the chat. An x-ray, an ultrasound, an MRI, a biopsy, or you've got the answer and you're, and, and you're not going to get any additional studies at this time. All right, so people want some labs. I'm looking for, I said chat when it really should have been Q&A, but I've got them both up. So the, the chat idea is a metabolic panel and a CBC, thinking uh, along the lines of an infectious process. And an ESR would be a, a possible idea as well. Um, absolutely. And I didn't get any of those, just to, to let you know that. Um, and the reason I didn't was because this was a, a gradual process over six months. These were kind of soft um, when he palpated them and, and they came and went. He also didn't have any systemic findings, anything making me think, you know, is this infectious, inflammatory or oncologic? That's when I would get the, C, uh, the SED rate, the CBC, the metabolic profile. I think those are all, if you're headed down that, um, is this cancer line? Is this a sarcoma? Those are all great options. Um, and my first pass was no, it's not. So the next question is um, idea um, is you know imaging, and lots of people are excited about an ultrasound, and that's the way that I went was I got an ultrasound. So this is not actually his ultrasound. I stole this picture off the internet because downloading it out of our EHR was too hard, and it was done at an outside facility. But and I'll be honest. I would not, I'm not great at reading ultrasounds, but right in here, if you're looking from outside, this is the skin layer. Oh wait, make sure you have my pointer up. Skin layers up here at the top, oops. Come down through some subcutaneous tissue. This thick white line right here is the muscle fascia. And here is what we're sort of looking at. There's a defect and this is of the two centimeter uh, lesion that we saw, um, or this is what the two centimeter lesion that was on his left leg looked like. And, and so you see that there's this differentiation of the tissue with a break in the, in the fascia. So this is a, a, a muscle hernia and it's of the tibialis anterior muscle. And these are, most common in adolescent male athletes, unsure why there's a male-female differentiation. And the, the primary cause is a congenital weakness in the fascia. That for some reason, this individual just doesn't have a strong fascia there and gets this odd um, bulge that comes on with more use of the muscle. So the tibia, tibialis anterior is used for dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. And so it, or for dorsiflexion, sorry. 
And so in a game like soccer, it gets increased use when you're running a lot. Additionally, repetitive trauma. And if you think about the shins of the soccer players that you know and see in your practice or you know, around your house, even with shin guards, they're frequently bruised. He has been playing for the past eight years on a you know, weekly, now daily basis, and he's getting some repetitive trauma there. So um, the, the, they can become painful and they can actually result in nerve entrapment over time. They need to be a little bit larger. There's not like a great body of data out there about these. Um, so it's almost all case reports. And typical treatment is, I'm sorry, not compression stocks. You don't put this person in the stocks and pillory. I apologize. But instead, you um, put this, uh, you use compression stock, socks, and those can be used both during athletic activity and afterwards. Um, hang on, let me jump over to the questions for a second. So, um, is this anterior only? In this situation, yes, but they don't occur only in the anterior um, lower leg. The lower leg is the most common location for a muscle hernia, and, but it can happen both in the posterior leg and the anterior leg. I think that he probably has a combination of a, of a congenital weakness in the fascia and also the repetitive trauma that brought this out. Um, does he have insurance? Yes, he, he did have insurance. And if he hadn't had insurance, you know, the next question is, well, how would I treat this? And so I probably would have brought him in for an in-person exam or had him see his primary care doc uh, at a federally qualified health center where we could do a little bit better job of palpation. And, and then if headed down the same thought process um, to try to establish what this was, we would then get a, um, we, we could just go right to the compression socks, not stocks, yeah. And our shin splints ruled out. So because there's the deficit in the fascia that we saw in ultrasound, that does rule out uh, shin splints. In extreme circumstances with lots of pain and lots of discomfort, you can, you can have surgery done um, to, to repair that fascia. So, a, a somewhat atypical uh, diagnosis, but I don't see a lot of, of this via telehealth, but I was glad that we were able to use the sort of patient-driven exam. And if an athletic trainer had been there or the nurse, I could also have asked them to do the palpation. And so when documenting that, just like if I asked my, the, um, one of the nurses that I work with to palpate lymph nodes, when I document it in my note, I write the you know, exam performed by, the, by nursing and reported anterior chain adenopathy. So that is um, you know, an experienced school nurse, I think has the, the ability to palpate lymph nodes and tell me if they're swollen or tender or not. Um, great. And are there any conge other congenital abnormalities that go along with this? So no, this, from my research, this tends to be an isolated congenital abnormality. Um, Melanie Gold had asked earlier about um, hypermobility syndromes in the, in the realm of Ehlers-Danlos. And this is not something that's typically seen with Ehlers-Danlos. There does not seem to be a correlation there. Thanks. I will let it hand this off to our next presenter. Thanks, Steve. Let me share my screen here. Okay, can you guys see that okay? Yep, we can see it. Okay, great. Well, hi everyone, I'm Kelly Garber. I'm the lead nurse practitioner and clinical integration specialist with the Medical University of South Carolina Center for Telehealth. 
And it's my pleasure to be with you today to share a case that I'm calling ocular redness. It's more than meets the eye. I do want to thank um, the School Based Health Alliance for the opportunity to present alongside two of my mentors and um, highly respected experts in the field of telehealth. It's truly an honor to be presenting with Steve and Stormy. So thank you for this opportunity. I don't have any disclosures. I do want to take just a minute to tell you a little bit about the MUSC Center for Telehealth. In 2013, the South Carolina legislature funded MUSC to create a statewide telehealth network, which is now known as the South Carolina Telehealth Alliance, or SCTA. The primary goal is to establish a statewide telehealth network with a common infrastructure in order to improve the health of all of our South Carolinians. Now, the MUSC Center for Telehealth is the headquarters of the SCTA. And so as such, we don't just develop telehealth programs at MUSC, but we support other providers and organizations throughout the state in developing telehealth programs in their own locations. The center was established to assist with things like strategic planning, service development, contracting, legal issues, compliance and billing issues, and workflow creation. In 2017, HRSA designated MUSC as one of only two national centers of telehealth excellence. And we are thankful for the HRSA funding that allows us to evaluate our various telehealth programs and to disseminate best practices nationally. So on to the case. Johnny is an eight-year-old male who presents to the school nurse with a complaint of red eyes. His mom is worried about pink eye, so she refers him to be seen by the school nurse. The school nurse requests a telehealth visit so she can determine whether he needs to be sent home and treated for bacterial conjunctivitis. Upon initiating the visit, the nurse practitioner obtains additional history from the patient, the school nurse, and the mother who's available only by phone. So what else do we need to know? If you guys would enter um, questions or thoughts in the chat, and Maddie's going to read those for me because I'm not able to see it. What other information do you think we need to have? Someone asks, um, does anyone else at home have pink eye? Is there eye drainage, onset, pain, loss of vision, tearing, cold or runny nose, eye injury, allergies? Well, thank you very much. You just actually went through my entire presentation. So I'm <laughs> gonna move on to the next slide and answer your question. <laughs> so the eye, eye redness has been present for about two months. There is no history of trauma. There is tearing that has been sort of coming and going, but getting more frequent. He's sensitive to light, which is also progressing. There's been no discolored, thick, yellow or green drainage from the eyes. He does complain of discomfort. There's been no itching, but he does have a mild stuffy nose, a little bit of clear runny nose and a dry cough, presumed to be his typical allergies. He's reporting that his vision is a little bit blurry um, there's never been any swelling or um, puffiness around the eye. Treatments that have been tried so far include loratadine, cetirizine, and olipatidine eye drops. So the past medical history for this young man is that he's a healthy young man. He's up to date on all his vaccines. He does have a history of seasonal allergies, which are typically in the spring, but no history of asthma or respiratory problems no known medication allergies. He doesn't have any history of joint problems or ongoing medical concerns. And he's never seen an ophthalmologist, but he has had normal vision screens at school with the most recent one being um, this past October. He lives with his parents and his five-year-old brother. Everybody tends to have spring allergies, but nobody currently has pink eye or um, conjunctivitis of any kind. His brother does have asthma and there are no other um, chronic problems noted within the family. So Johnny is an eight-year-old African-American male who presented to the school nurse with the complaint of red eyes, emphasis on red eyes. He began with redness about two months ago, was seen by his primary care provider who diagnosed him with seasonal allergies and started Claritin. His eyes continued to be red and the redness worsened, so the school nurse referred him to be seen again. The second provider also diagnosed allergies and he was changed to the Zyrtec and the allergy eye drops were added. And he's been taking these for two weeks at the time of the visit where I saw him. 
He's never had, as I mentioned, itching or discharge, but his eyes have been watery at times. He's increasingly sensitive to light, closes his eyes if he's out in the sunshine and kind of guards his eyes, has to wear sunglasses if he's got them with him. He's also been complaining of eye pain, never had fever, no sore throat, other than the mild congestion and cough that I mentioned. He hasn't had any other um, severe upper respiratory symptoms. No ear pain, no abdominal complaints, no joint complaints, no recent insect bites or tick bites. And the teacher did tell the school nurse that he's been squinting more in class when he's looking at the board. So now that we have that detailed history, let's talk a bit about the physical exam through telehealth. So many of you may be providing care through school-based telehealth. In our case, we do have a full telehealth cart on site in the schools. And with the cart, we have a digital stethoscope, otoscope, and exam camera. But we do not stock an, op an ophthalmoscope at each site. But many of you may have been like our team where we had to quickly convert to seeing patients at home through direct-to-consumer video only visits without the use of peripheral devices. So I'm gonna approach the exam from the perspective um, at, uh, that you can do this with or without having those uh, telemedicine peripheral devices. So I was always taught to do a thorough exam, at least from the waist up with children, regardless of the chief complaint. So whether you're seeing this child in person or um, through telehealth, I would always recommend doing a more thorough assessment than just looking at the eye. This particular visit was completed in the school setting. So as I mentioned, we had access to the telemedicine peripheral devices. And this allowed for a thorough exam, including auscultation of his heart and lungs, evaluation of his ears, nose and throat, and of his eyes. And since we didn't have an ophthalmoscope, we couldn't do a more extensive eye exam, but we were able to evaluate the conjunctiva, the sclera, the extraocular eye movements, the presence or absence of drainage, light sensitivity, and swelling without the use of an ophthalmoscope. In the school setting, this is done with the assistance of the school nurse. But when you're conducting the visit with the patient and parent at home, you can still complete much of the exam even without those peripheral devices. So you may need the parent or a guardian to help facilitate the exam at home, but it can be done with a little bit of patience. Sometimes you have to work with them to tilt the phone or the camera in the right way, but it definitely can be done. So of course, just through video, you can assess the overall condition of the child. You can observe the respiratory rate, the status of the patient's breathing without a stethoscope. Obviously, you can't auscultate the lungs or heart sounds, but the detailed history will guide the determination of whether that's a necessary component of the exam or whether you need to refer them to in-person care to be sure that that component is completed. As I mentioned, the eyes, the external ears, nose, throat can all be examined using just a flashlight and the assistance of the caregiver. If the history would indicate the need to do an abdominal exam, you can ask the parent or caregiver to face the camera towards, say, a couch or a bed and have the child lie down and ask the caregiver to press on the abdomen. Now, this doesn't replace the type of exam that a physician or nurse practitioner may do in clinic, but you can at least assess whether there's tenderness, they can report whether it's firm or distended, and you can look for guarding. If there is a concern about an abdominal complaint, Another tip would be to have the patient jump up and down. If they can do this repeatedly without pain, that's a reassuring component that it's not likely to be something more serious or dangerous in terms of a surgical nature. So back to our patient. What did we find on the physical exam that we did connected to the school nurse and the patient at the school? Well, he was very well appearing, normal healthy appearing child, but both eyes were noted to have pretty notable redness of the bulbar conjunctiva. The palpebral conjunctiva was clear. He was sensitive to light and kind of guarded and closed his eyes whenever the light was uh, shined at his eyes. And he asked for the lights in the room to be turned out to make him more comfortable. He was also noted to have tearing, which was worse during the eye exam. No discolored drainage. We had the school nurse repeat his vision screen at school and it had been 2020 the October prior this visit taking place in March had shown the vision to be reduced to 2050. The rest of the exam was unremarkable except for the mild nasal congestion with pale boggy turbinates and a slight cough. 
Okay, so this would be the polling section for mine. Um, based on that history and exam, what of these categories would you suggest is the diagnosis? Allergic conjunctivitis, bacterial conjunctivitis, viral conjunctivitis, MISC, or none of the above, we need further evaluation. And excellent, none of the above means further evaluation. Thank you so much, that is so true. The actual diagnosis was uveitis and iritis. So the uvea is the middle layer of the eye between the retina and the white part of the eye. The iris or the colored part of the eye is located in the front portion or anterior portion of this uvea. Iritis is actually the most common type of uveitis and is sometimes referred to as anterior uveitis. Uveitis is actually inflammation of part or all of the uvea and symptoms include eye pain, light sensitivity, headache, blurry or de decreased vision. And in some cases, patients do report like dark floaty spots in the field of vision. It can be very serious and lead to problems such as vision loss or even blindness. Infection, injury, and autoimmune disease are common causes, although oftentimes the underlying cause is not identified. In Johnny's case, there were several red flags that suggested uveitis and iritis rather than conjunctivitis. These were, as noted here, pain, tearing, photophobia, blurry, and reduced vision. If you are ever evaluating a child with a red eye and you have any of these what I call warning signs or red flags, you have to think beyond pink eye. As mentioned, common causes include infection, injury, and autoimmune disease. This is a list of possible disease associations um, that have been shown to uh, come along with uveitis and iritis. Now, ultimately, this young man was diagnosed with sarcoidosis, which is a chronic inflammatory condition that involves the growth of small collections of white blood cells in various parts of the body. And these are most commonly found in the lungs, lymph nodes, joints, eyes, and skin. It's believed that the condition does result from the body's immune system responding either to an unknown substance or to its own proteins. Sarcoidosis is rare, with the incidence is estimated at being 10 to 20 per 100,000, and it's most common in adults between the ages of 20 and 60. African Americans are affected more often than Caucasians, and African American children tend to have a more severe disease process than others. There is increased risk of having sarcoidosis if a family member has it, but to date they have not identified a gene for sarcoidosis. Common presenting symptoms include a skin rash, such as granulomas, erythema nodosum, or sores on the face, cheeks, or ears. Arthritis and uveitis are also common presenting symptoms. Lung involvement is also possible with uh, presenting such as a persistent dry cough, wheezing, chest pain, or an abnormal chest x-ray. And as you might recall, this young man had a mild cough for several weeks that was thought to be allergies. So clearly this was a complicated diagnosis of a rare condition in this age group. And I did not make the final diagnosis, but I was able to spot the red flags that indicated this patient needed further evaluation. I called our Storm Eye Institute at MUSC and was able to speak with a pediatric ophthalmologist who advised a same day appointment. I facilitated the family getting to the appointment by getting the patient worked into the ophthalmologist schedule and working with the mother to facilitate transportation. Once she took him to the appointment, the ophthalmologist diagnosed the iritis and uveitis and prescribed drops, including corticosteroid drops and close follow-up. She then referred him to the pulmonologist where he had a chest x-ray and he was then referred to rheumatology for further evaluation. So in conclusion, I'd just like to say that Telehealth isn't always able to make the final diagnosis, but it does connect kids to care. We can always evaluate what's presenting to us and refer for further evaluation when indicated. Thank you. I'm going to stop sharing and hand it over to Stormy. Thank you. That was great, Kelly and Steve. Um, let's see, let me go ahead and share my screen.
All right, can you guys see that okay? Yep, we can see it. Okay, perfect. Well, I'll just uh, start with talking about um, our program. So I, I'm Stormy Williams. I'm a pediatrician by training, and I'm the medical director and vice president of network development and innovation at Children's Health in Dallas. Um, so we have a school-based telemedicine program among a myriad of other telemedicine initiatives within our health system. Our school-based telemedicine program is where I started, where I was introduced to telehealth, and so it is my baby, it is so close to my heart. We started in two small preschools and have now grown to um, a little over 200 schools in the North Texas area. If you're familiar with Dallas, we go um, as far south as Lancaster, Texas, and then we go as far north as the Oklahoma border um, and east and west as well. And so we're really able to serve kids who are in schools both in urban as well as rural settings. Um, we are not, we do not function as the primary care provider for these kids. We typically do uh, low acuity sick visits uh, really to help school nurses because we know that they are kind of the silos of healthcare within their schools. Um, but to provide some access to those children while they're in school, you know, where they spend the majority of their day. And the other thing that was important to us as a health system was seeing how um, really a lot of the patients that we initially started with um, kind of close and around our hospital were using the emergency room after hours for non-emergent issues. So that is what we were trying to seek. How can we reach these kids where they spend the most of their time to provide a, um, a convenience and a necessary service to uh, the parents, the children, as well as the school. So let's, okay, so we are gonna start with um, this first case of a 16 year old girl who has had a rash for a little over a week. The rash is itchy. Um, and she said it started in her right armpit, her right axilla, um, and it was itching her so bad. Um, she initially thought that maybe she had irritated it from shaving and used a new deodorant. Um, but it seemed to be getting worse um, and it developed this, this red rash. So they um, treated her initially with, mom just treated her with an over-the-counter um, antibacterial ointment first. Uh, and then when she noticed that it wasn't getting any better, she tried an over-the-counter ringworm cream that she had at home. So after two or three days of that, it, things were getting worse and they did not go to the doctor, they called a family friend who was a physician who called in a, a, a pack of steroids, an oral steroids. And so this, they felt like made the rash worse. And the rash ended up spreading to the entire body is what they said. Um, so outside of that, they're saying that um, she may or may not have had any fever. Um, she, does, she felt a little kind of icky last week or the week before the rash came. Um, she's had some sore throat from her allergies, but no other symptoms, feels fine now outside of this itchy rash. Um, so outside of that, before I move on, I just want to know, you can go to the Q&A section to see if anybody has any particular thoughts or questions that they might want to ask. I will give you a second here. Immunization record, that's a great question. So her shots are completely up to date. And um, mom said that she's never had a, a reaction like this before. So no known histories of allergies and she didn't think that she even had sensitive skin. Um, so that wasn't a concern. And hey, Allison, hey, I see your name. <laughs> Any other thoughts? All right, I'm gonna move forward so we can take a look at her. All right. So this is what our rash uh, looked like. And it started in the right axilla, like I said. And um, mom said that when she saw it, she has other children who have had ringworms before. So she was pretty certain that that's what it was um, in that right armpit because she described it as being circular and raised. Um, and then um, also noticed that, um, uh, but you know, after the myriad of treatments that she had, things were definitely getting worse. And 
what was concerning to mom was that she felt like every time she looked at her that there were new spots or new um, extensions of the rash. But again, what's important to note here is that she actually feels really good. And ironically, um, the, the rash appeared to the, um, the school nurse. Um, the nurses happened to notice it around her neck. Um, and that's why we did the visit. It wasn't because they were seeking care for this. So we can bring up our poll here and um, just kind of see what people are thinking. What is the, yeah, there it goes. So what is your diagnosis? These are some of the things that were on our differential. And while you guys are doing, I'm going to go there. I just noticed that there are more um, questions in the chat. Um, let's see. Anyone else with symptoms? I'm going to uh, actually get into that. It's a great question. Um, does it involve more than the trunk? No, it did not extend beyond her uh, torso. No known food allergies and no itching worse at night. Um, no family members with a rash. That's a great question. Um, scabies, that's a great thought as well. Oh, MISC. Well, I will tell you that this case was from oh, about a year ago, so that was not on my mind. All right. So we've got the results of the polls up, and it looks like about 34% of you thought that this might have been tinea corporis um, ringworm that was worsened by steroids, which is a great, great thought. Um, and then second was uh, contact dermatitis. Also really, really good thoughts. So here is a clue. So remember when I said that the, this patient actually was not there for a visit. This, the patient was um, there with her mom and her sister. Her sister was actually in the school nurse's office for a, um, for a sore throat and a, and a fever. And so um, mom said that, oh, she doesn't need to be seen, our, um, our friend, prescribed her some steroids and she says it's not getting better, but I can tell that um, it's not bothering her as much. Um, so the itching was a little bit better. So now, yes, so I hear <laughs> several people saying that. So um, let's see, let me go to the next slide. So I said, let's strep them both. So when um, I saw the sister for her sore throat, her symptoms, she had you know, um, swollen lymph nodes in her neck. She had um, just a beefy looking uh, tonsils and a strawberry tongue. So we ended up doing a rapid strep on both of them. So our diagnosis for this child is scarlatina. So scarlatina is also known as scarlet fever. This is the rash that is caused by strep pyogenes. And the rash is actually due to a delayed type skin reaction. And it is characterized by these diffuse erythematous, um, usually papules and some macules um, that generally occur with the diagnosis of strep pharyngitis. But as we've seen here, a lot of times the throat diagnosis or the throat symptoms aren't what's most prevalent. And early on in the history, I noted, I, I noted that she said, oh yeah, I've had some sore throat, but it, it, it was just due to my allergies. And so that's very common. I don't know if you guys have seen that, where um, you know, we're kind of thinking that it might be strep, but um, we just don't know because they don't have a sore throat, right? Um, and, and, and also one of the things I didn't say in her physical exam, her throat actually looked completely fine. I did not notice any, I had the, the nurse palpate for swollen lymph nodes on her as well, did not notice any swollen lymph nodes there either. Um, and so with this rash, uh, you know, we typically call it the sandpaper rash. Um, and I'm used to seeing it. I usually notice it on the face and the upper trunk, like around the, the neckline. Um, but it typically starts in the groin and the armpits and spreads to cover the trunk and the extremities. So what's really interesting and what really kind of threw me off with this rash, and it, it's so really textbook for, um, for scarlet fever, are these posteas lines. So I'm going to go back to the picture of the patient. Here we go, sorry. So you see how her bra strap on her neck 
had that, that red line there. That, those are what we call um, costias lines. And basically what it is, it, and, and you also notice that there's some desquamation. Um, I don't know if you can see my, oh, sorry. Um, in, the, in the axilla, you see some desquamation or peeling there, as well as that, uh, that red uh, rash that's right where her bra strap was on her neck. Those are postias lines. And um, those are um, usually the pressure points and the skin folds can be worse with strep. And um, those are kind of things that you can look for, especially in pale skin when patients have darker skin or um, dark brown skin is difficult to see. And a lot of times you may only feel that sandpaper rash. Um, but this rash does tend to desquamate, especially the longer it goes without treatment. Um, and speaking of treatment, it's oral antibiotics. It's just like how you would treat strep throat. Um, oral penicillin and or amoxicillin, not and or, but or amoxicillin. The penicillins are the first line of choice, except if there is um, a penicillin allergy. Um, and so just because of the, the way that we all were thinking, I wanted to recheck her in a few days just to make sure that she was getting better. And it in fact had improved drastically. So I had them stop the antibiotics, stop all of their other treatments and just do, um, I'm sorry, stop the steroids and, and give just a 10 day course of antibiotics. And I saw her on day four and she was extremely better. Okay. So um, I knew that the, that was um, something that's not really a hoof beat, <laughs> as, um, as Steve would say, there's not necessarily a zebra, but I think that these are some of the kind of bread and butter things that we see in pediatrics that sometimes just can, um, can worry us in terms of what we need to d d just be looking for in, in um, school telemedicine. And again, because we aren't the primary care providers, um, a lot of times things walk into the school nurse's office that they really, the, the nurse is like, wait, that needs to be looked at. I understand that you're under the care of another doctor who had not seen her, but this, this is concerning for me and we want to see it. So I was happy that we were able to do that. So no cardiology concerns or follow-ups. If they do, you know, the whole reason that we treat strep is really to prevent the, um, the sequela of strep. And so we, we're trying to prevent rheumatic fever. And so that's one of the reasons why we treat for um, strep because it can uh, self-resolve, but that's one of the main things that we do. So no, there's no necessary, it's not necessarily uh, to treat for um, or to worry about cardiology in these patients. So um, I, I have time for one more case. So um, this one is a 16 year old male with an itchy rash on the right leg for one month. So it's um, just on one leg and he's an older kid. So he just kind of, you know, it wasn't bothering him that much. And um, they, they just really didn't decide to do anything for it or he wasn't very concerned about it. Then um, his mom noticed it and had him treated with an over-the-counter ringworm cream. Again, um, concerned for ringworm. Um, and they treated him for two weeks, twice a day. And he, they were very adamant that they were treating it because he's in sport. So they were thinking that, you know, uh, with, uh, the, um, with the strep, uh, I'm sorry, with uh, his contact sports that they wanted to make sure they were treating him for ringworm. So um, the teacher noticed that he seemed to be, that the rashes seemed to be getting more um, in number and sent him to the, to the nurse and said that she wanted him to have a doctor's note saying that he wasn't contagious. So previously healthy, like I mentioned, he was a football player, doesn't have any other concerns for um, past medical history, no other types of rashes on his body or with the family, no other systemic symptoms. So there was no itching, I'm sorry, no fever, no URI symptoms. Um, but he just says that those little, those spots itch, um, but they just weren't that bad. So this is what the rash looked like. And this is um, real-time photos that we took with our telemedicine equipment. Um, so um, these were on his, um, kind of one was on like the shin area and the other was um, kind of on the, I would say the lateral aspect of his right leg. And um, so as you can see, there's some scaling there. There's definitely a base of redness there, but what, what was kind of, what stood out to me 
was the, the scaling and the redness, even though there was two weeks of um, an antifungal treatment. So um, here are the keys to our diagnosis here. It's not improving with a consistent antifungal use. And they, like I said, they were really adamant that he had been doing, he had been treating it correctly with twice a day for two weeks antifungal cream. Um, and this rash had been present for a month and getting worse. Um, and what was also noticed was just that he had very dry skin. So for, for me, when I was looking at this kid, um, my, some of the things that I asked about is if he had a history of uh, atopic dermatitis or eczema, had he had a history of just itchy skin? And they said that, yes, he did have a history of some dry skin, but nothing like this. Um, so anyway, the more that we looked at it um, and the more of history we took, we diagnosed him with numular eczema. And I'm, I know I'm moving a little fast because I wanted to squeeze in two cases here, but numular eczema is non-contagious, a chronic inflammatory skin condition, just like atopic dermatitis, but it's called numular. That's um, um, also means coin shaped. So there are multiple coin shaped eczematous lesions, usually on the extremities and on the lower trunk. And they look, they can look like a ringworm um, that has been either poorly treated or treated with um, um, some uh, topical steroid and uh, antifungal treatment. So it's similar to other forms of eczema. However, it's different in appearance as well as distribution. So we know with typical eczema, it's usually uh, symmetrically um, located on, you know, on both sides of the body, as well as in those typical flexor parts of the antecubital fossa behind the knees and um, in the in the elbow creases. So with this, the main treatment is to reduce skin dryness um, and the exposure to any irritants. So we talked to him about using mild non-scented soaps as well as using really good emollients and moisturizers twice a day. Usually with numular eczema, because of that layer of scale that's there, you typically need to start with a moderate to higher potency steroid cream and or ointment. Um, than you would a typical atopic dermatitis. I don't know what is going on, why I'm, I'm moving like this. Um, so anyway, with both of these cases, I just want to point out that the benefits of school telemedicine and school-based health is that you can always recheck. You know exactly where those kids are gonna be for the most part. So don't be afraid if you don't have all of the answers. One of the great benefits of um, our program and uh, all the other programs out there that we have the school nurse that's there all the time. So we uh, have used school nurses to say, hey, can you pop in and look on that kid and see if he's not getting any better? And then we can always re-see him, I mean, you know, recheck him. And then also don't forget about your other resources besides the school nurse. There are other treating physicians, the PCP. Um, I've called PCPs before to get a little bit more history um, about some of the patients that we've seen and just really make sure that we're doing a great job of continuity of care. If I was gonna send either of those kids into the PCP, I would go call and give them a heads up about what I'd seen. So um, I just wanted to encourage us all as we're in this fight, COVID is going to change probably everything like we um, have, have been used to doing. I know that all of you are really on the front line. So my thoughts are with you all and uh, just always know that you can reach out to your resources. So. Thank you very much. I will stop sharing my screen. I think. Thank you so much. <laughs> sure. Thanks, Dr. North, um, Kelly, and Dr. Williams. That was really great. Um, so now we're going to have time for a few questions. Um, so if you want to put them in the Q&A um, on your Zoom control bar, that would be great. Um, but we already have a few questions. Um, Dr. Williams, you kind of alluded to this, but someone asked, um, what likely is going to be the impact of COVID and disrupted school access for some of these programs? So that's a great question. And that's something that we've been working with um, our, our team. The benefit for us is that we do have several different telemedicine programs. So we're actually looking at doing something where we're kind of calling like school telemedicine at home for kids who are doing e-learning, um, where we wouldn't have access to the equipment that, you know, digital stethoscopes and otoscopes and things like that, but we might be able to do um, almost like a direct to consumer type of visit with our patients where we can still do video based um, uh, telemedicine visits with those kids who are at home. 
but I, I you know, like I said, it, it is going to look different and we're all trying to figure out how best to be able to do this. I'm really hopeful that, you know, every fever, every cough or sore throat doesn't just get sent home for quarantine, you know, for 14 days, um, just with the fear of COVID. But you're right, things are just going to be completely different. Yeah, absolutely. Dr. North or Kelly, did you have anything to add to that? And this is Kelly. I would echo what Stormy has said. That's what our program has done is um, to do a direct to home video component where we can continue to see the kids at home um, through, you know, at the parents request for virtual visits in light of the modifications that have happened due to COVID. Yeah, um, and I, there's one other thing that um, someone I want to touch on. I want to make sure we don't skip this because someone said if we don't have access to the digital equipment, how do we examine an ear? The answer is that you don't. Um, there's no way to, it, to really diagnose an ear infection without looking at the tympanic membrane. I think if you have relationship with some of those families um, that you can kind of go off a of history. Sometimes we have those kids who they're like, oh, he gets you know, three ear infections a year, he has a fever in his right ear, ear hurts. So you might trust being able to treat that. But, you know, again, with telehealth, we do what we can do. We diagnose what we can. And if you don't have a clear means of diagnosing something, don't just try to appease the family and give uh, antibiotics, really try to direct them for, you know, the proper level of diagnosis that they can get. Yeah, definitely. Um, someone else asked, how do you bill for telemedicine visits? Hey, this is Steve, and you can bill for a telemedicine visit just like you bill for a typical e and code, uh, 99213 or 214. Um, and you do need to add a modifier dependent upon the insurance. It's best to check with your local and your state regulations regarding what modifiers. Currently, the, the most common is GT, indicating that telemedicine was used. And now in the time of COVID, many insurers are asking that you add CR um, in addition to the GT if you are seeing the individual at their home. Yeah, absolutely. Dr. Williams or Kelly, did you have anything to add to that? No, no, I think um, the, the great thing, like there's one silver lining, I shouldn't say one, but one, one of the positives of COVID that we can look at is that we can all bill for telemedicine now. So there have been so many different regulations for each state around billing for telemedicine, but now we can all bill for telemedicine. So that is amazing. And just the same thing that Steve said, you, you bill like you would for any other visit. Right. I think we have time for one more question. Um, someone asks, what other tricks do you have for evaluating body parts that cannot be visualized by the provider via telehealth? Hey, there is a great resource and I'm gonna pick it up and drop it in the chat um, from Caravan Health around how to, what, what you can do. So that may be the, the easiest way to answer this. I'll add to Steve, um, Old Dominion University has produced some uh, telehealth exam videos that can guide clinicians in terms of um, how to do video exam when you don't have peripherals. And they're um, available on YouTube. Um, they're not proprietary. They were done, done as part of a HRSA grant. So um, I did include, if you all have a copy of the slides, I included those links in the resources section. Um, and I find them very helpful just to trigger ideas about how to be creative and to um, be able to complete the exam when you're not there in person and when you don't have peripherals. Um, yeah, so actually um, I'm gonna send the, the, the higher level link off the website. Um, somebody may wanna repeat it out there, but. Mid-Atlantic Telehealth Resource Center has a great set of resources and the Old Dominion University um, videos are included in that. Got it. I'll be sure to include those resources um, when we post the recordings and everything um, after this webinar. But unfortunately, that's all the time we have for right now. Thank you so much again, Dr. North Kelly and Dr. Williams for your great presentations. Um, before we go, I'm going to launch some um, evaluation poll questions. If you could just answer these um, to let us know your feedback and anything we can do better. Um, but that's it for today. Thank you everyone for joining us. Have a great day.